Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be in a position where we can again come together to study your word. And we would like to ask again that your word and your word alone do the talking. Help us through this difficult topic which we're going to look today, look at today, and send your spirit to guide us on our way. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, welcome again. We are nearing the end of our series on um, Give Me the Bible and the Bible Only. And today we're going to look at a specific piece of prophecy which I called the wine of Babylon, or you could refer to it as the woman of Revelation 17, or the woman in scarlet. We're looking at a very sensitive topic today. One that I would prefer to skip, if I could. But now, Revelation 17 is in the Bible. And if we were bold enough to study chapters 10 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 18 and 19 and 20, we should not be afraid to look at chapter 17 as well. Now, we concluded last time with a verse in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. Let's just recap on that. For I testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that were written in this book. And then, if any man should take away from the book, from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 17, which we're going to study, stands in direct contrast to Revelation 12, where we discovered the woman in white, the pure church of God. Now, in Revelation 17, we meet this other woman, also a, a church in the end times, but one that has been defiled, defiled with false doctrine. And in the vision revealed to him on Patmos, John describes the great controversy between Christ and Satan, and in this process he uses symbols to, die, to describe this false religious system in the end that will be led by a false Christ while waging war against God's children in the end time. And, and he uses symbols like the dragon, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, but perhaps the most striking of all are these two women. The woman of Revelation 12 and the woman of Revelation 17. On the one side he sees uh, in vision the woman of Revelation 12 and he says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. He describes God's end-time church called out into the world to be the remnant waiting for his return to earth. And then he describes them in verse 12 of Revelation 14. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then he looks to the other side and he sees this woman in Revelation 17. And he describes her as a harlot, a woman in scarlet, 
with a golden cup in her hand, full of the abom abomination of filthiness of her fornication. Let's read it. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven veils, and talked with me, saying to me, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. We've had that. We've, we've, we've been there in our study. And then in verse 4 he says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And then we read in verse 5, And upon her forehead a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of the harlots and the abominations of the earth. And then he concludes in saying, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, dear friends, our study today is a very important study. Misinterpreting this piece of Scripture can cost you everlasting life. Because at the end of time, there will only be two places where one will be. You will either be with a woman in white, or you will be with a woman in scarlet. Now, Revelation 14, which we've seen, has got the last warning, the three angels' message, the last warning of God to mankind just before his second coming, we read some frightening words. We've read it before, but let's read it again. Revelation 14, 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, dear friends, this is frightening words. So the correct identification of this woman, called Babylon, this corrupt religious system, is essential because the Bible says that in the end, all the world will wander after the beast. So let us now make absolutely sure about the identification of this woman. This woman described in the Bible as Babylon. Now, verse 9 of Revelation 17 gives us the first clue. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, which city was built on seven hills? Well, it's documented by Rome itself, documented Roman Catholic sources states. It's within the city of Rome called the City on Seven Hills that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. And you can read that in the Catholic Encyclopedia, page 529. Now, what are these seven hills of Rome? Rome is known to be built upon seven hills. Rome was said to have been founded when the Romulus and Remus twin sons of Mars ended up at the foot of the hill, and then they, and then they name 
the different hills, the seven hills. That's our first clue. Now our second clue we find in verse 9. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now history tells us that there was only one power on earth that waged war against God's children. Millions of Christians lost their lives in the Inquisitions. Well, as a matter of fact, Pope John Paul II admitted it in public that it was the, f that it was the case. And Pope Francis asked the Waldensians uh, to forgive them. So that is also a clue. And then, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now, anyone visiting the Vatican today will immediately recognize these two dominant colors in the Vatican, purple and scarlet. And then Revelation 17 states, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. In contrast to the woman in white standing there without any decorations, just the bright light shining out of her, this woman is decked with gold and decorations. It's actually striking to see the amount of gold and jewels in the Roman church today. It's an actual fact that the Vatican probably has the most physical gold in the world today. Now, let us now turn to this cup that she has in her hands. What is in this cup? The Bible says it's full of fornications, which refers to false doctrines. And the tragic truth is that the Bible states that the whole world will wander after this woman. What would be the first false doctrine that's in this cup? As sad as it may be, it is Sunday worship instead of Sabbath worship. Nowhere in the Bible we find that the Sabbath was changed. Jesus kept the Sabbath. His followers kept the Sabbath. The first church kept the Sabbath. The Bible is very clear on this point. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work or any work. Then in Ezekiel we get the same Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. If you're looking for the sign between me and my people, here it is, the Sabbath. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the Catholic Church claims that Sunday is their sign, their mark of authority. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible, so without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is actually the proof of that fact. And now Jesus comes and he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So sadly, Sunday is the first thing in that cup. The second important false doctrine in that cup what would that be? The doctrine of the immortal soul. The Greek heathen concept that came into the church. The common belief that you go to heaven or hell immediately after you die. Now we've looked at that. A lot of books written on this subject. Five minutes before and five minutes after you die. We've looked at that book. There's also one, one minute after you die. Heaven and afterlife. What happens 
after death. Life after death, heaven and hell. Nowhere does the Bible refer to an immortal soul. Jesus calls death a sleep. And according to Jesus, death is a state of unconscious sleep in the grave, in the grave until he comes back. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Jesus self speaking. Romans 6, 20, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And then we see Jesus, they're telling him that Lazarus has died, his friend, and he says to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may awake him out of the sleep. And his, his disciples does not understand what he's telling them. They said to him, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. If he's only sleeping, he's going to get well. But Jesus saw that they did not understand what he was telling them. And the Bible states it. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of sleep in rest. And then he says it to them straight, plain, frank. And Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he stands before that tomb and he says, Lazarus, my friend, come out. And the question we asked was, he's been in that tomb for four days now. The Bible states it. What had Lazarus to say about heaven? Was he not in heaven then? What did he have to say? Nothing. Why not? Because he was not in heaven. He was sleeping in the grave. Daniel knew it. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. John, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to me myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If I'm with Jesus five minutes after I die, why is it necessary that he should come back to fetch me? Now, David knew it. As from where I will build my, your face in righteousness, I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. And then Jesus self repeats it. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then the verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Three times in one chapter in John. The Bible says that there's only one that has immortality. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality. The third false doctrine in that cup, what would that be? The everlasting punishment in the fire of hell. Now, Dear friends, this doctrine has in actual fact been responsible for many people to disregard the teachings of the Bible. And with that even their faith in Jesus. We showed you this book, Life After Death and Heaven and Hell. Now, the misinterpretation comes from the word forever and ever, mentioned a few times in the Bible. Perhaps we should look at that specific word. The word forever or, or eternal in the Bible, in the original text, the Greek, it's the word ion. The word implicates 
a restricted time period. I don't know whether you knew that. A period with a beginning and an end. At times it also trans it's also translated with the word century, which we, as we know, has a beginning and an end. The Greek scholars J. H. Moulton and George Milligan note in their book vocabulary of the Greek Testament that there are evidence that the word ion refers to the lifespan of a person, which of course has a beginning and has an end. The equivalent of ion in the Hebrew is ulam, or ulam. And on more than one occasion, it refers to a time span that has an end. Exodus 12.24 speaks of the Passover as an ordinance to be observed forever, the word olam used there. We know that that was just up until the cross. First Chronicles 23.13 talks about the priesthood that would be blessed forever, olam. We know that the priesthood also was just up until the cross. Now, let's turn to the Bible. Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, and that is that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, said the Lord of hosts. Let's turn to Sodom and Gomorrah, the two cities. Jude 1.7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There the Bible states it. Sodom and Gomorrah, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Are they still burning today? No, they are not. So what does that mean? What does that mean? The eternal fire. Well, the Bible explains itself. 2 Peter 2.6 Referring to Sodom and Gomorrah and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Into ashes. Condemned them with an overthrow, having made them an example unto those that should live ungodly. They are the example turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Psalm 37, 20. The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of God shall be as the fat of lambs, and they shall consume into smoke. Shall they consume away into smoke? They shall be as though they had not been. So the consequences, my brother and sister, of the fire will be forever. But that's only the consequence. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. We read in Revelation 20 verse 9. And then it reads, And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. The King of kings and the Lord of lords who only has immortality. So the consequences of the fire will be forever. But not the fire itself. It's quite logical if you think about it, my dear friends. Can it be that Cain is burning for 6,000 years now? Um, and somebody else that's gone to hell a few weeks ago, is burning only for two weeks. Does that make any sense to you? No. 
to burn forever and ever, you need to have an immortal body. But the Bible says there's only one that has immortality. The next thing in that cup, what's there? What is in the cup? The law was nailed to the cross. Grace and grace alone. There's no more law. We're under grace. There's been done away with the law. The law has been nailed to the cross. We are not under the law anymore. We're under grace. In the New Testament, we have a new law, love. Now, we looked at that in the previous presentation. I just want to recap. Talking about the moral law, God says, and I will put on the stones the words which were on the first stones which were broken by you, and you are to put them into the ark. So the moral law, the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God on tables of stone, was put into the ark. That was the moral law. In the most holy place, it was put in the ark of the covenant. But there were also other laws. And it came to pass when Moses, Moses had made an end of the writing, the, law, the words of this law in a book, not on stone, but in a book. And Moses wrote it until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying to them, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. Two laws. Two laws. The law, the moral law, the ceremonial laws, outside the ark. And we concluded in our previous study that the ceremonial laws was the law that was nailed to the cross. Two laws, the moral and the ceremonial law. Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus says, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. To make them complete. To make them complete. What more could there be in this cup? The secret rapture. We looked at that in a previous presentation and we just want to recap left behind the book written on the rapture the widescreen movie made of the rapture of this book and uh, then we asked the question what did, does the Bible say about a secret rapture and then we so that the Bible is very clear, clear on that. The second coming will be visible and it will be audible. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. And then Paul says it to the Thess Thessalonians, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, audible, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It's quite clear, my dear friends, nothing secret. Nothing secret about the second coming of Jesus in the Bible. No secret rapture. Visible, audible. Not two different groups staying alive. The one to be raptured away, the other to go through the tribulation. One group taken away, as in the day of Noah, taken away in the flood. They will die. The other group going with Christ and those that have, ri have raised from their graves into heaven. I think that was quite clear to us. What is also in this cup? The speaking in tongues. Now we haven't 
talked about that. Yet, uh, while the Bible is very clear that the tongues of which it speaks in the Bible are understandable languages. While the Bible states that an unintelligible language, meaningless language, is today depicted as a sign that you have received now the Holy Spirit or that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So we need to look at this word, glossa, in the Greek. Glossa, there's three different meanings for this word. The word tongue in the mouth, it's the first meaning. Then tongue, which depicts an understandable language. Or tongue, a small part of a music instrument. There's no word in Greek depicting an unintelligible language, not in 1500 years of Greek. The point here is, what does the Bible then teach about speaking in tongues? I think we need just to read it, because the Bible is quite clear on it. Let's go there. Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this sound was heard, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speaking in his own language. Heard them speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how hear we, every man in our own language, wherein we were born? The Bible is quite clear, isn't it? The people who listened to this message was from 20, approximately 20 different dialects gathering in Jerusalem for the feast. And they had to go back to their own homes. And the miracle of the speaking in tongues was the fact that they heard the speaker, the speaker, everyone heard the speaker in his or her own mother tongue. The language of birth. That was the miracle. Why? So that they could go back and spread the gospel where they come from. And that was the miracle of the speaking in tongues. Now we find this again in, in Acts 10. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word. And they of the circumcision that believed were amazed. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then answer Peter, Can any man forbid the water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Is he referring back to Acts 2. They've been given the Holy Spirit as we received it. In other words, there's no difference here between that we heard in Acts 2 and what we hear here. They are talking about understandable languages. In the last instance, you find this in Acts 19 again. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. Nothing different. Nothing new. Understandable languages. Listen to Paul himself on this, sub this subject in the letter to uh, the Corinthians. 
He says, 1 Corinthians 49, So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. It's Paul himself. He says, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He's quite clear on this, isn't he? If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? Have you ever read that? Will they not say that you are mad? Let's listen to Benny Hinn for a moment. And believe me, I was there. The glory of God was most unusual, as you see. Fire on you and your ministry. Bring those pictures, bring them. Bring those pictures, bring those pictures, bring those pictures, bring those pictures. Bring those pictures, my God. Fire, 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 fire. Bring Paul Crouch here. Can't get up here. Can't get up here. I have God. Fire on you, Paul. Fire. Fire on you. Can't fire. Pick up Kent. Fire. Pick him up. Fire. Pick him up. Fire on you. Pick Paul up. Pick Paul up. Let's fire on you, Paul. That's fire on you. That's fire on you, Kent. That's fire on you, man. Preach your minds. Bring your Get Sammy over here. Lift your hands and bring the Holy Ghost. That's fire on you, Tim. Come here, Ralph. Come here, Ralph. Come here, Ralph. Ah. 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 Come here, Mr. Brock. Come here, come here, come here. Fire on ya! Show hands, go ahead. Such divine, divine presence is here. The privilege, Bruce. The privilege. There's miracles happening everywhere. Lift your hands, receive your healing. All that word is coming to you tonight. Aroka papa, lalfa mianta kanta lalmi. Oh, Steve. Mente kintil el fetro piol bo kunto mara. Montil el ketro piol be mintere. Speak that prophetic word, brother of God. Take your microphone and speak that word of prophecy. Manto kalbal alfa piol ba kunto el me. Eke sunde mata te he te te he. Sandre he. Sandre he se kotata. Manga. Manga potete ramasu. Put your hands and bless the Lord. Furi, furi parale kusapatata. Andre sushe patu. Rishibare kapasa. Pure 
Tell the people, O oh man of God, what the Spirit is saying to you. Now, dear friends, if, if this is the way in which the third person in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, reveals himself to man, then I'm afraid that I do not understand the Trinity. Nowhere in the Bible you will find the Holy Spirit appearing and people falling backwards on the ground. As a matter of fact, just the opposite is true. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. Nobody fell backwards. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will fall forward on your face. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face. And Moses and Aaron when, went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and they fell on their faces and the glory of God appeared to them. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God. No wonder, dear friends, that the Bible says the earth will become drunk with her wine. Let's conclude. The name Babylon reminds us of the Tower of Babylon of old, which we read of in Genesis 11, 7. Go to, let us go down, says God, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Now here in Revelation, God calls this woman Babylon because of the confusion, the mingling of truth and lie in the cup that she holds in her hand. And it says that the whole world will be affected and even engulfed in her wine and will become drunk. Now, Babylon is a, is a family name. Uh, this woman has daughters. Now, who would these daughters be? Well, the only logical conclusion is that it must be the churches that came from her. And that would be the churches of the Reformation. They are still today drinking from the same cup. They are in the same tradition and they are teaching the same doctrines. I know because I come from there. And the tragic fact is that thousands, if it's not millions, of God's Sincere people are today in Babylon without even knowing it or recognizing it. And for these children of God, he has a loving message. These children in Babylon, listen to what he says. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his, with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, 
and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth had uh, their wealth increased by the power of her evil ways. And then you hear God say, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not her plague. These verses actually tells us that most of God's children in the end time, just before the second coming, will actually still be in Babylon. And now he's calling them out. Why would they have to come out? We've already said it, but let's just say it again. Is it for them to be saved? The answer is no. They are already saved. They are God's children. Come, of, come out of her, my people. Why should they come out? Well, there's the reason. Come, of, come out of her, my people, that you may not be partakers of her sins and that you receive not her plagues. Because the time is nearing when the plagues will fall. And if you're still in Babylon, the plagues will fall on you as well. People come to me and say, but what do we have to do now? Our pastor says the commandments has been, have been nailed again to the cross. We need not to keep the Sabbath anymore. You can choose your day on which you want to worship God. We are under grace and under love. My brother, my sister, at some point, God says to his children, this is now far enough. You cannot keep on holding hands with an institution that's asking you to break my law. Break now and come out of her, my people. Now this, my brothers and sisters, I think is the most difficult thing to do. This is no joke. This is not easy. Actually, it's a frightening and an emotional thing when you hear it the first time. Leave my church. Leave my church. There where I was baptized, there where I was uh, taught, there where I was married, there where I baptized my children. They, 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 see, they see this corrupt system. They even, they even see the necessity to come out of her. But it's still one of the most difficult things to do. Because where to now? Does God, God want to them to float around with any anchor? Well, dear friends, luckily not. As sure as there is a woman in scarlet, there's also a woman in white. And John describes her. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And then chapter 12 concludes. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what happened to God's pure church. The dragon was wroth. For 1,260 years they persecuted God's children. And then God came and he opened the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation to his children. And a new movement rose 
out of that who proclaimed and is proclaiming the three angels' message throughout the world. This is the remnant that reinstated the true biblical message of redemption through the blood of the Lamb and through this blood alone. All children of God will assemble on Mount Zion and have peace and security forever. But in the meantime, they will keep the law of God out of love for what He has done for them. Come out of her. Thank you.